The Vice detectives are put through their paces while protecting a young witness to a homicide on today's Miami Vice. Line of Fire was directed by Richard Compton and was written by Raymond Hartung, and it introduces a new supporting character in a somewhat surprising way. Let's get to it. Crockett testifies against a drug lord named Carlos Cantero, played by Ahera Nipale, who murdered one of Crockett's informants. Cantero's attorney, played by Michael George Owens from season 4's Amen Send Money, questions how much weight the jury should place on Crockett's testimony because Crockett has a tendency to, you know, lose his memory and try to kill his partner. Crockett is offended by this line of reasoning, but honestly, I think the attorney might have a point. Remember in earlier seasons how Crockett would dress nicely in expensive suits whenever he needed to testify? Season 5 Crockett can't be bothered to find a t-shirt without holes. At headquarters, FBI agents Daly, played by Barry Primus, and Bates, played by Full Metal Jacket's Kevin Major Howard, ask Vice to help them protect a key witness against Cantero, a teen named Keith Mollis, who will testify that he saw Cantero murder a DEA agent. Crockett, Tubbs, and Trudy guard Keith in a nice hotel suite while Switek keeps watch outside. Keith, who is played by Justin Lazard, is a punk and heavy metal loving club kid who constantly mouths off to the detectives. He's enraged to learn he won't be able to leave the hotel until the trial, so he shuts himself up in his room and blasts the video for Stigmata by Ministry at full volume. The bulk of this episode will be devoted to the Baby Boomer vs. Gen X showdown between the Vice Detectives, Crockett in particular, and Keith, who is, like all us Gen X kids, mouthy and disaffected and jaded and prone to spouting phrases like, idealism is for losers. It's like looking into a mirror. He's obnoxious, sure, but Justin Lazard seems to be having a lot of fun with the role, as do our vice detectives, so this episode mostly works. Keith sneaks out of the window and takes a taxi to a punk club. His exit is noticed by Switek, and Crockett manages to track him down while he's headbanging with a cute blonde on the dance floor to Madame Axe by Rugged Edge. The cute blonde is played by Teresa Blake, who played Crockett's girlfriend back in season 3's Forgive Us Our Debts. Crockett hauls Keith off the dance floor and drags him back to the hotel, not noticing that they're trailed by the blonde. The hotel suite is promptly raided by armed men who enter through the balcony and shoot the place up. Crockett and Tubbs kill the gunman. So Vice moves Keith from the hotel. They smuggle a decoy into Tubbs's Cadillac while Crockett and Keith zip off in the Ferrari, unnoticed by the blonde who trails the Cadillac. Vice moves in and detains her, whereupon she identifies herself as an FBI agent. Tubbs refuses to reveal to the FBI where Crockett has taken Keith, but he promises that Crockett will deliver Keith safely to the courthouse in time to testify against Cantero. Keith, meanwhile, is on Crockett's boat on the open water, and they pass the time by fishing and bonding and arguing about music. At at one point, Crockett, while extolling the virtues and longevity of Eric Clapton, says of the raucous music coming from Keith's boombox, you think those guys will be around in 20 years? The song Keith is playing is Iron Maiden's Only the Good Die Young, and as much as I hate to contradict Crockett, it's now been more than 30 years since this episode aired, and Iron Maiden is still very much around. A passing helicopter sprays the boat with bullets. Crockett tries to take out the gunman, and then Keith passes him a flare gun, and he's able to take down the whole danged chopper. Realizing that Cantero's goons somehow know their location, Crockett and Keith prepare for another attack by building a bunch of Molotov cocktails out of beer bottles. That is some downright strange product placement for Lowenbrow. Knowing there's a leak somewhere in the FBI, Switek and Tubbs trail a guy named Reyes who is known to trade in secrets from the feds. Sure enough, they see Reyes meeting with Bates. Switek and Tubbs move in and arrest Reyes, but Bates flees. Reyes tells Vice that there's a huge bounty on Keith's head, and that a lot of major assassins have come to Miami to try and claim it. The FBI bugged Castillo's office to keep track of Keith, which means Bates knows when and where Crockett's boat is supposed to dock. Agent Daly insists this was all part of the FBI's greater plan. The FBI knew they had a leak, and they used Vice to lure him out in the open. Crockett and Keith dock and find a gaggle of assassins waiting for them. Crockett fights them off with the surprise aid of Bates. Not knowing Bates is working for Ken Tarot, Crockett and Keith let their guards down, and Bates shoots Keith in the chest before Tubbs arrives and kills Bates. Keith is rushed into surgery in critical condition. And it turns out Keith isn't really Keith. He's an undercover DEA agent named Joey Harden. The real Keith Mollis has been uneventfully protected by the FBI this whole time, and he's taken to the courthouse to testify against Cantero. However, the real Keith suffers a loss of nerve on the stand, he refuses to testify, and Cantero is set free. The episode ends with Crockett and Tubbs visiting a recovering Joey in the hospital. Joey will return for two more episodes. This sort of makes him the Cousin Oliver of Miami Vice in that he's a youthful character brought into a once popular TV series in the final season in the hopes of boosting sagging ratings. Miami Vice doesn't need Joey Harden, just like the Brady Bunch didn't need Cousin Oliver, but you know what? 
I don't mind him. Justin Lazard is good enough in the role that even at his most over-the-top obnoxious, there's something at least a little endearing about him. As for the story, I'm not sure it makes complete sense that Keith slash Joey would be sneaking out of hotel rooms and causing so many problems for Vice if he was really a law enforcement decoy instead of an actual punk kid, but maybe we should assume that the FBI gave Joey instructions to make himself as visible a target as possible to lure the leak out in the open. The scenes with Joey and Crockett bonding on the boat drift into sentimentality, but that doesn't mean they're not effective and Joey and Crockett form a believable bond. We can believe that Crockett sees himself in young Joey. It's not a standout episode, but I like it, so three flamingos. Next time, Trudy goes undercover as a sex worker to catch a serial killer. Until then, please hit subscribe or find me on Twitter to talk about this episode, and I will meet you back here later. Have a great week.